Welcome everybody. This is our community meeting to discuss the new WBPA mentorship program. Um, my name is Jenna Wallace. I am the chair of the Committee on Early Career Psychologists and I'm joined by Chantel Weisenmuller who is the chair of the Colleague Assistance Committee. We're so excited to be here with you today and help you to learn more about this new program. Before we get started, we would like to share some wisdom from one of our great mentors, Dr. Um, Tracy Woodrow. The thing that has served me the, the best in terms of just career advancement, but also in kind of finding mentors is getting involved. So, you know, really, and it can be as simple as um, eating lunch, lunch in, in the lunchroom with other people or, or just getting involved on committees or things like that. And when I have done those things and just kind of watched how people interact, then you begin to see who navigates well in, in whatever the, the, the place is, whether it's a school or a clinic or or a bigger organization like a university, you start to see who um, who knows how to do it and how to do it well, you know. And whether that's their specific career, you know, whether you know psychologist, psychiatrist, physician, professor, whatever, or it's just they are good at building relationships um, and bridges between people, then that then that tends to be kind of who, who I look for, because if they can do it well, then hopefully they can help me to learn how to do it well. If you guys haven't had a chance to check out the website with all this wonderful advice from our mentors, we encourage you to do that. Um, and we think that they do a really great job at helping us to figure out how to navigate this world of being good mentors um, and also seeking mentorship appropriately. As you guys are logging in, I see that some of you are already posting in here, but if you will join us on Poll Everywhere, the link is in the chat. Um, and we just want to use this platform to be able to, um, to connect with you and, and get your questions as we move forward. So it looks like some people are um, currently in Huntington, hometown Boone County, grew up in Georgia, grad school in Kentucky, um, Elkins, Bellington, Charleston, currently Morgantown, Morgantown. Awesome. Excited to have everybody here today. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Weisenmuller. Thank you. So I'm so happy to be joining y'all today. Um, thank you, Dr. Wallace. I'm delighted to be here to support the this program and I've been delighted to support Dr. Wallace in the development and rollout of this mentorship opportunity. So mentorship, as you know, is a professional relationship that involves a partnership between a mentor and a mentee and the furtherance of the mentee's goals. And this can include activities such as support and guidance and motivation and role modeling and whatever else needs to occur within that professional relationship to help the mentee succeed. This collaboration was developed as part of a joint effort to support well-being of psychologists throughout the state of West Virginia and is in part a natural outgrowth of discussions that arose in our fall 2019 um, conference where we talked about mentorship as a pathway and a platform to support ethical practice um, and to support psychologists' well-being. And we were really struck by the interest of the folks who participated in developing a mentorship program for our state. So today we're gonna to be talking a little bit more about both the benefits of mentorship um, in West Virginia, especially our rural communities, and also um, talk about how we would like to start rolling this out and how we can make a program um, serve the needs of folks in our communities. So the benefits of mentorship are multiple. Um, in addition to supporting psychological well-being for both mentees and mentors, research has consistently demonstrated tangible and professional benefits for both mentors and mentees. On the mentee side of the equation, research consistently demonstrates that folks who receive mentorship are more satisfied and committed to their professions than folks who are not mentored. Additionally, there are some tangible or measurable benefits, such as mentored individuals often earning higher performance evaluations, higher salaries, and faster career progress than, than non-mentored folks. And on the mentor side of the equation, 
Mentors often derive satisfaction from helping the next generation of leaders, feel rejuvenated in their own career development, learn new things, such as learning new technology. As I was sharing with Dr. Wallace, I'm learning through our partnership with this presentation, as well as becoming more aware of emerging issues, methods, or perspectives that are important to their field, um, especially things that are affecting onboarding professionals earlier in the career span. In rural communities, mentorship is especially important, and we'll touch on on that in just a moment. When we think about the different forms mentorship can take, it's certainly not a one size fits all proposition. And on the screen here, you can see a couple or four different examples of formats that mentorship can take, and it can certainly fluctuate over the course of a working relationship. These things can very much be driven by the individual participants needs in the mentorship um, relationship. Comprehensive mentoring um, includes addressing across the board needs that the mentee may have at different times over the working relationship or over the career span, including focusing on different individual weaknesses or strength building opportunities. While maintenance mentoring would be more dedicated towards advancing along a specific course of study or a specific aspect of career development and motivating and supporting someone in moving forward to accomplish a specific goal. This is often time limited. It may be one portion of the person's larger career path. Transitional mentoring is really effective in helping folks as they transition from one career stage to another or from one environment to another. So for example, as an early career psychologist transitions into to the workforce as an independently licensed provider, transitional mentoring may help with that role transition from being a postdoctorate supervised psychologist to being an independently licensed psychologist. Similarly, somebody who is navigating the transition to retirement or winding down their professional duties would also potentially benefit from transitional mentoring. And finally, aspirational mentoring can be incredibly helpful for folks who are, are oriented towards a future position or a future role that they're not yet engaged in. And in this situation, an aspirational mentor can help close that gap between where the person is now and the skill set and um, the abilities that they would need to be able to engage in that future role. Within rural communities, certainly all of the benefits and all of the needs previously mentioned apply, but there are unique stressors that exist in rural practice. Our colleague this morning who presented our ethics workshop did an excellent job of laying out the myriad unique and special stressors that we may encounter in rural practice often resulting from high community needs and having fewer resources available, as well as having a smaller provider community that interweaves with our personal communities. These unique stressors contribute to increased professional stress and burnout at times. And research has shown that barriers to accessing professional support is often cited as an influencing factor for provider decisions to either stay and practice in rural communities or to leave rural communities to practice elsewhere. And that's a finding that has held consistent, not just across the psychology, social worker counseling, but also within the broader medical and healthcare communities. As a result of this, a great deal of research has focused on how to support engagement and, and retention of providers in rural communities and has consistently demonstrated that network and networking and supportive relationships are key for retention, the sense of belonging, and improved practice in the rural setting. However, it really is dependent upon institutional support for the mentorship time. Because certainly in rural communities, as is true in many places, where we have high need and fewer resources, making space for that mentorship and making sure that it can be fully utilized without impinging on other, er, other areas of our practice or time management is really important. So some of the challenges that are unique to rural communities and that we're hoping to really address through this program is that, as, as mentioned a moment ago, we do have fewer psychologists in rural areas, particularly for um, our colleagues who find that psychology or healthcare practice is a small community in their, their, in their region. It may be challenging to reach out and establish those connections with folks who are more geographically removed. The smaller psychology community can also contribute to awkward personal and professional overlaps that could complicate a mentorship relationship. Additionally, many rural mentors are also practicing psychologists and again, citing some of those unique stressors that we experience in our rural workplaces. 
adding mentorship and professional development roles on top of clinical caseload and productivity can be challenging for the mentors and the mentees. So in weaving together this range of benefits and challenges um, and under the, the expert guidance of Dr. Wallace, we hope to offer a mentorship program that can address or circumvent many of these barriers and maximize the benefits and, and serve as a resource for our members. Thank you so much. And we want to hear from you right now. How many mentors do you have? Looks like we're all kind of connected to mentors and it speaks to what Dr. Weisenmuller was just mentioning that, you know, we have mentors in different areas of our practice, of our lives. Some of us have personal mentors who help us through personal situations. We have academic mentors. Some of them we have contact with regularly. Some of them we might check in with once a year. Um, and what we know is that satisfaction increases um, with the quality of those mentorship relationships. And it's something that we want as, um, as a society to really, really push for our members and have that as an added benefit. So why are we doing this? I mean, the simplest way to say it is the work that we do is hard and it's getting harder um, with coronavirus, especially and, and other like natural disasters and challenges that we experience here. Um, there are so many added layers to the work that we do and there aren't that many of us and we live far apart. Um, and we also have a lot of wisdom and life experiences to share with one another. So, you know, in my words, it's simple, we need each other. Um, and that's the reason that, that motivated us to start this program. So to get into the nuts and bolts of the program, um, as a committee, when we met to discuss what would be best to help connect folks, we thought that we would start with some small groups um, that are surrounding interest areas or areas of clinical practice that we work in and would like to connect more with others in. Um, and so I will share the link to the uh, survey in just a minute. But the idea is that these groups will be led by at least one mentor um, that we will identify as the person responsible for setting up the times to meet, um, for creating any kind of materials or sharing materials for the group to use, um, and set up discussions or other areas that you guys want to include in your group. Um, and then what will happen with our, with great luck mm. and with good work is that one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationships will then form organically within those groups. Um, these will have rolling enrollment so that folks who become WBPA members or who are students that have moved into the state will be able to join these special interest groups. Um, and within the group you have, in multiple groups, you have the opportunity to be both the mentor and the mentee. So for example, I might seek mentorship in early career psychology issues and be able to provide mentorship in neurodevelopmental disorders or other categories that I feel competent to provide that leadership and mentorship in. Um, the materials and consultation for this service will be provided by the WBPA leadership. We are um, creating forms, documents, topical discussions, things that will be beneficial for the groups, and we are available for support um, for things as simple as tech and things as complicated as ethical issues that might arise. Um, and we will also be involved with scheduled check-ins and surveys to be able to constantly evaluate this program and make sure that it's meeting the needs of our um, members. What it is not is supervision. And so I think when we look at these small groups, it's reminiscent of our vertical teams that we might have experienced in graduate school. And we do want to make sure that these don't become supervision groups. That's not what they're intended to be. They are intended to be um, mentorship. And so the value added for you as a WBPA member, why would you be involved with this program? And I think that the benefits are multiple. Um, first, having access to a cohort of people who share common interests with you can be really challenging to uh, grow and achieve in a state like ours to learn from mentors and collaborate with them on projects that you have, ideas that you have to improve the field of psychology in our state. Um, mentorship specific programming at WBPA conferences. So we do plan to have um, at least one at every in-person conference where mentors and mentees can be together for dedicated time um, and do things together in groups. 
regular contact with the Committee on Early Career Psychologists and opportunities to be involved with the projects that we are running and hope to run, as well as programming. That also leads to leadership opportunities within WBPA uh, as a whole, which is something that we really value um, and the leadership is really interested in engaging folks um, that are graduate students and ECPs who want to be involved in leadership and want to be able to form that pathway for themselves. Connection for research and scholarship, um, for me particularly, I think that's something that's really valuable that I can get out of my special interest groups is other folks who have like-minded ideas um, and may be interested in collaborating on presentations at conferences and publications and then support during emergencies and rapidly changing circumstances, which our colleague assistance committee already does a phenomenal job at, um, and we hope that the mentorship program will only increase that support for you. So I'm opening this up for what questions do you have? We will answer the questions in just a minute, but you should see this on your poll everywhere. Uh, whoop, and I cleared that response because it was mine. Okay, so how do we make it last? We know what we want to do. How do we actually make this go? Um, and you guys may have had ideas or seen things happen in the past in different organizations or in your workplace that maybe just didn't catch the momentum or the steam that you hoped. And what we really need is for you um, to see the value of this and to understand how this could make your life, your career here in West Virginia more satisfying and make you feel more connected as a psychologist. Um, to sign up and attend the meetings, to tell us what's working and what's not working, and to invest your time and energy in this. So what do you do now? If you want to pull out your um, iPhone and use this QR code to sign up for the program, you can do that. Um, I don't know if it's just specific to iPhones or if other phones will work. Um, but Chantel also just included in the chat the link for the Qualtrics survey, so you can use that as well on your computer. So I see some of you pulling that out. Okay, I'm going to hand this over as you're thinking about the survey or looking through it at first. Um, Chantel is going to tell us more about the Colleague Assistance Committee. Thank you. So the Colleague Assistance Committee is a group of folks who support the well-being of psychologists throughout the state. And in, in the past few years, we've taken a two-pronged model to this um, on the um, kind of primary prevention end of things, offering professional development and outreach through um, information provided to, through the WVPA newsletter and also professional development training opportunities at the fall conference around how to utilize colleague um, assistance, how to prioritize psychological well-being for ourselves as providers as the foundation of ethical and competent care, and then also looking towards involvement and mentorship as a way to meet some of those self-care needs and uh, professional support needs. And then on a secondary prevention level, We've also worked with folks throughout the state, including our colleagues in the West Virginia branch of the National Association of Social Work to put together a roster of providers around the state who um, are willing to make themselves available to provide counseling services um, confidentially for psychologists or other mental health providers who um, perceive a need for additional support for themselves. And that provider directory is available on the colleague assistance page of the WBPA website and also we have sent it out to membership several times this year through emails. So we we feel very happy with with the services we've been able to provide over the last couple of years and felt very grateful to be able to quickly mobilize and connect with folks during the early stages of the pandemic, especially back in the spring. And at the same time, this is a very long term project as, can, as needs continue to emerge as we continue to stay in the trenches providing the services we provide. So we would really like to extend an invitation for folks who are participating today or folks who may be able to interact with this recording later that if you're interested in joining the Colleague Assistance Committee, participating in some of the, the resources and the services we offer, we would love to have you join us. We're very interested in having representatives from across the professional career span. So from graduate students through early career, mid career, all the way to retirement and after to participate um, and to be able to help us meet the needs and, and support the well-being of, of our colleagues. Great. They, you have been doing excellent work with this committee, so thank you for sharing that. 
Um, and then for us, for the CECP, the, co the Committee on Early Career Psychologists, um, you know, our mission is to expand um, the membership of early career psychologists within WVPA um, and give them a voice within the state organization, um, increase the number and recruitment of psychologists to our state, um, and really find ways for ECPs to be able to build their own leadership and professional skills, um, and to have support for their goals, um, and, and then also advocacy is another really big area that we focus on. It's a pretty new committee, so I'm only the second um, chair of this particular committee. And again, like Chantel said, I welcome as many members as are interested, would love to have you involved. Um, we've been recruiting folks and I'm very happy that we're expanding, but there's so much work to be done and so many opportunities to continue to build your professional skill set. So let's see if there are any questions that have been popping up. What's the time commitment for this program? So that's a great question. Um, and we do think that each group will be kind of setting their own boundaries, setting their own um, kind of expectations within the group. Our idea initially was that committee or that, um, excuse me, mentorship groups would meet once a month. And that's kind of the minimum standard that we would like to have in place. Uh, most of that will be done virtually, as you can imagine. Hopefully, as we grow through COVID and eventually, hopefully, past COVID, people who are local to one another can meet in person as well. But we do anticipate that the commitment is what you want to put in it and what you see as valuable for you. And Dr. Wallace, if I can follow up. Um, in addition to the group-based mentorship, if folks were to decide that they would like to engage in individual mentorship with somebody they connect with through the groups, we would encourage the mentee and the mentor to have an explicit conversation about the time commitment and the duration of that relationship early in your work together. Um, and we can provide some additional resources for mentorship groups and also make other resources available as far as kind of how to navigate that conversation and have some explicit um, you know, open understanding of what the nature of this time commitment and availability would look like. Um, it's likely to be a bit different for every mentorship uh, dyad, and it's really important that it meets the needs, not just of the mentee, but also the mentor. Absolutely, thank you. Um, when do groups start? So our start date um, is likely to be the beginning of 2021. So we are now deep into October. We hope to be able to have some preliminary groups formed by that time and have them started. But like I mentioned earlier, those are on a rolling basis. So if, for example, we don't have folks that are interested in a specific area right now, we will keep your name and contact information on a list. And then when we form other, when others um, are interested in that area, then those can be started as we have interest. You can absolutely change your group involvement and you can also be involved in multiple groups at the same time. Um, and that's really the hope is that some folks might feel like they're ready to mentor in an area and then also need to receive mentorship in another area for those of you who are um, ECPs, mid-career, late career. I mean, all of us based on the needs assessment we did last year are in need of kind of both of these things. Um, and so you can definitely be involved in multiple groups and change over time. Okay, we are getting close to the end here of our time. I do encourage you to join us at our mixer. Um, I know that a virtual format for a mixer can be very awkward. Um, and so there's some trivia and things that I've created to hopefully make that better for us. Do we have to be, this is a great question, do we have to be members of WVPA um, to participate? And so the answer for this is yes. If you are participating as a mentee, um, we do want you to be a WBPA member. And that is why we um, have thought so much about the value added. We do think this program specifically is a value that our membership has lacked for a while um, that they will be able to then take advantage of. So the answer to that one is yes. All right, um, hope to see you at the mixer again. Please join us, even if you have, can just drop by. And then um, I look forward to talking with you all as we continue with this program. We're so thankful that you see this as a valuable part of your career um, and hope to talk with you soon. Bye.